<laughs> okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we decided to talk about the limbic system. So I hunted around for uh, main, my main goal was to find something with lots of figures. And uh, I think this paper does a reasonable job with that. And I've added, because I did, I had some previous presentations on related topics, so I pulled out some other useful figures. And uh, for the second half of the paper, the, there's some, the depression related sort of stuff is a whole lot of text, basically. So I'm, I'm just going to put the PDF in front of you. Um, uh, but uh, so this is the paper by um, uh, Price and Revitz. So it's an anatomy meets uh, clinical kind of paper. Uh, and I think it does a, a good job of surveying a whole lot of data. All, but interestingly, if you're aware of the literature, you'll also catch the, the sort of weird holes in, the, in what they've chosen to talk about, um, where, which could have actually helped their case um, a little bit. And they kind of get lost in, in my opinion, <laughs> a little bit lost in the weeds with cortical parcellation, um, which doesn't actually say much, really, I think. Um, so, um, so yeah, the, um, the one thing that I noticed right at the start, because I'm in uh, the Barbus lab, is that I have never seen a review paper that says this. <laughs> that this description is based primarily on experiments done in the Price lab. Um, <laughs> studies in other labs, especially those of Barbus and Petridis, have provided data that are largely consistent, which is fine. I agree. They're largely consistent, but there are, you know, some details that, that are, aren't really. And there's one thing I'll point out very soon that I found very odd. But it was good to, to mention it up front, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, because I think that I, I've read other papers of um, Price and with others, and I don't remember this exact statement. And I think I also don't write statements with exactly like that, but I, not that I would have that body of work, but you know, I think that we, we, it's hard to, to do justice to everything. So yeah, in the yeah. sense was very upfront and transparent. You would just fine, yeah. Um, so uh, just, I mean, I guess all us kind of know this, but it's like um, a lot of us know this, but yeah, the, the limbic lobe, the word uh, comes from this uh, Latin, which for kind of uh, rim or edge. Um, and it referred initially to this, this the limbic kind of this sort of medial gyrus, you know, Paul Broca named. Uh, and uh, I, I like this part here that um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, some of the stuff that was being said in the 19th century, it was like, there's a lot of overlap with what's currently happening, but um, both due to lack of anatomical and functional data, there was a tendency to overinterpret uh, limited data. And just when I read that, I was like, what will people uh, say about us 50 years from now? And then right at the end of this very paragraph, they say later generations may look at our misconceptions with the same demused uh, tolerance as we have for our predecessors. Um, and like that. And uh, so um, in figure uh, from McLean, in, which is 49, which in my opinion is not that long ago. To, uh, it's really funny to see like the word guilt on here, which you would expect from like the 18, like 60s, not 1949. Yeah? But, but yeah, guilt is here and, and sex in the precunious. Like, <laughs> uh, so so um, there's some sort of odd things. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, just the rest of it is just anatomy. Um, so there's some other pictures of the same sort of story that, so I think the 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 papers papers circuit um, came first, and then McLean kind of modified it. Um, and the the short story is that uh, uh, straight from the sort of second half of the 1800s onwards, people were doing lesion studies and then studying patients, human patients post mortem, and they collected this kind of information about where uh, in, uh, emotion, motivation, feeling uh, seemed to be particularly modulated. And that's, that's how we get this limbic circuit. So it's been around for a while, actually. Relatively stable concept. Um, and uh, so I gave this presentation uh, um, uh, for some people in Germany a while back. So I, I love this story. So one, one, once I was do, doing this review paper on, uh, on uh, emotion and cognition. In fact, Louise was the, was the editor of this, of this Frontiers issue. And um, I said, well, let me start from the beginning and ask like, when, when did people start thinking about the amygdala as being involved in emotion? And uh, this is the first paper, uh, Brown and Schaefer, uh, 1888, and it's really funny to read this paper because the terminology, um, like they just say, 
they name a monkey and, and sometimes they, they're like five or six like case studies. And one of them, they can't identify the species even. Um, and, and they remove huge chunks of the temporal lobe. And um, in many of them, they claim nothing happened. <laughs> the monkey recovered and no, showed no symptoms. Um, but then in, in a couple of them, there was this peculiar idiotic condition. I just love seeing this kind of old fashioned terminology. Um, but yeah, okay, so what happened was she's tame, she exhibits no fear of mankind, which shows uncontrollable fashion on the approach of other monkeys, so that it is now necessary to shut her up in the cage by herself. So I think a lot of us will recognize Klubabusi syndrome in some form, but this excessive uh, passion might relate to something else, because such a large chunk of the brain was removed. As you can see here, the vast amount of, of the temporal lobes, which included some of the amygdala. Um, uh, and so gradually you kind of had this story that we kind of whittled it down. It wasn't the hippocampus and it wasn't the entorhinal necessarily that would produce those effects. It was the amygdala and the Kluwer and Busi, I think in the 30s, uh, showed that he the monkeys, not necessarily humans, um, was just, uh, overeating and inappropriate eating. So they, another term is hyperorality. They would just sort of put things in their mouth, uh, heighten the altered sex drive, um, inability to recognize familiar objects. And some of you would have seen these um, case studies. There's, a, there's at least one well-known uh, woman who either was born without um, an amygdala or, or was damaged fairly early in life. And she had no fear whatsoever. And she would wander around getting into extremely dangerous situations um, because she just didn't have any fear. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a good thing for her. Um, uh, I'd like to add that this was actually from where uh, Carl Prebram and uh, uh, Mart Mishkin actually localized the, the, the lesions further to say that IT cortex was involved in object recognition, all that stuff. This was like oh, the nice. start. Yeah, the clue of Busey was like much, much larger because they were looking yeah. at the temporal lobe overall. When they focalized, localized it, that's when like Prebram and um, uh, Mishkin, they both suggested that, you know, this this part of the temporal lobe is involved in visual object processing. So, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, actually, the the mapping into amygdala was, if I don't, if I remember correctly, was Weisskrantz. Weisskrantz, yes, yes. That Weisskrantz was the first and then people yeah. and, uh, and then uh, after uh, that, Michigan he, came after he, that, immediately after that, yes. Although the, the lesions of Weisskrantz I also had were a little bit larger than just the amygdala, but much, much smaller than the yeah. huge ones before yeah yeah, so was yeah. amygdala and periamygdaloid tissue okay. yeah yeah and so there's a review paper in blanking it was from the 60s so i kept trying to find out like more details about the paradigm uh and uh the one the reviews from the 90s onwards were, were very low on information they would just sort of give you this sort of one line version of, of what happens when you lesion the amygdala so i looked for better reviews and then i found that um, when you lesion the amygdala, or at least in, in, in some of those studies up to the 60s, the animal was catatonic for weeks uh, and had to be force-fed uh, until they recovered. So these symptoms that are often reported as the effect of the amygdala are also the effect of the, all the compensatory effects that are happening while the animal is recovering. And I, I love to remind people of this because it's so easy to, and in fact, there was something on Twitter about lesions today, and it's like, you cannot um, jump from a lesion study to what the function of the thing that you lesioned is, because the brain is actively trying to recover from the lesion. Uh, but people keep making this mistake over and over and over again. And it's amazing to see it in, in 2022. Um, uh, so in this paper, uh, they start. So here's how I think the logic of this paper is that they kind of work backwards from the hypothalamus. So I'll get to the hypothalamus in a sec, but the, uh, to like, uh, sort of like the hypothalamus being this interface with the body and, and like the blood and stuff like that. And they're like, we know, or, or like we think it uncontroversial that certain aspects of mood and drive uh, are, are happening in the hypothalamus. And we kind of sort of step back and say, well, how does the, the, uh, the telencephalon and the thalamus uh, engage uh, with the hypothalamus? That's one way of thinking about what they've done here. And, um, and that, along with the fact that the amygdala is sort of uh, has pride of place in terms of like the, 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 the brain area one thinks of when one thinks of emotional modulation. And so they show that 
there's all this sort of complicated connectivity. It's very, very well known. There's a couple of th things that they left out, which is because it's papers in 2010. So that they, I mean, they didn't know about it because uh, Helen and Bacillus from our lab, uh, right in this year, the following year, showed that in, in primates, there's a connection to the thalamic reticular nucleus. Pretty powerful uh, uh, projection, which was not known. And uh, later on, there's some other things also that were, were not well subsequently found. Um, but I think this sort of uh, projections to the uh, prefrontal cortex are more or less like what we see in our lab also, that um, heavy targeting of 25 and 32 ACC and subgenual ACC and a little bit elsewhere. And it kind of leaks out into other, other brain um, areas too. Um, not much on the lateral surface of the brain. So there's, there's a fair amount on the orbital surface and the medial surface. What's weird uh, uh, in this paper is that they don't uh, have 25 at all on, in the monkey brain. So they've got a kind of like their own parcellation, which is kind of non-standard, even for 2010. Um, I don't know why exactly, because um, 25 is quite important in this whole story, which, and they do talk about it when they get to the human data. Um, so, By the way, Johan, just a yeah. quick thing, you know, maybe you're going to get into the hypothalamus. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll bring it up after you talk about the hypothalamus. Yeah, I just thought I'd dig up a little bit of just the basic stuff. So so um, they they talk about you know, James and, and Lang on the one hand, and then there was Cannon and Bard. So there, there was a, there was these two sort of simplified stories, which I suspect, I haven't looked at how James, William James actually wrote about it, but I suspect it's an oversimplification. But the, the story as it's been presented in a lot of reviews is that James and Lang thought that emotions were just read out from the body or read out from the viscera. Whereas Cannon and Bard uh, pointed out that the, the, the top down, in, the interaction with what is already happening in top down kind of ways is important for what an emotion is. Um, so, I think that the James Lang kind of description of, of is a sort of almost a straw man, but but is even it? now some people do think this way. Is it? I mean, James did clearly say that you you're sad because you cry, right? So, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. James is William James is so smart that I find it hard to believe that it's not, <laughs> it was just a report. Um, uh, like for instance, uh, Dan Bullock likes to give this example of how cognition and, and, and emotion are, have this two way relation, like. Uh, which is that like you can get angry for some reason that involves the body, or you can get angry for a cognitive reason, like something that's like somebody argues with you for something quite cognitive, right? And on the other hand, you can have an emotion, like in fact, the example Dan Bullock likes to give is somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, oh, why? And you're a little bit angry with this driver. And later on, you find out this, there's somebody in the back who's being rushed to the emergency room. And that piece of cognitive sort of inf that information can it often causes the anger to just dissipate. So just from the phenomenology of, of, uh, of emotions, you can infer a fair amount. Um, so yeah, I, I, so they talk about this head ganglion of the autonomic nervous system, that's the hypothalamus, and it releases all these um, hormones, which I myself, uh, I've never really uh, dived into this literature. So it was nice to just quickly dig into the, some of the effects. Um, and I found, I was again hunting for good diagrams, and I found this one, which is nice because it really conveys some of, some of the sort of interchange idea that the, that the bloodstream interacting with the neural, uh, like with the central nervous system here. Um, so, because there's all these responses to to factors in the blood that the the neurons in the hypothalamus respond to. Um, so there's these different nuclei in the hypothalamus, and I myself don't exactly know what these structures are, but but uh, uh, as a result of the processing and what's in the blood, you see um, the release of um, hormones and chemicals related to various bodily functions, milk production and digestion related things and stress related. So there's this um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis linking the, the brain with the uh, rest of the body. So there's all these factors that get released. And uh, I don't want any citations on Wikipedia, but 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 I, I thought you know this doesn't seem too controversial. That there's all these aspects of the world that the hypothalamus uh, responds to in this sort of chemical way, not, which one would assume is not exactly an informational response. Uh, light, smells, um, steroids, so stress hormones, um, uh, signals from the heart, 
uh, the gastrointestinal system, um, autonomic input, uh, all sorts of th um, um, stimuli related uh, to digestion, etc. Uh, lymph nodes, I would assume, stress. So a lot of things. Um, there's, there's something kind of cool that I, I learned about the hypothalamus recently that people might enjoy. Um, it makes its own neuromodulatory ligands depending on what it receives. So if it detects ghrelin, it's, it basically translates proopio melanocortin and it starts to read out different gene products that end up being MSH, which then be, act as ligands for different receptors, which then turn on or off the rafe or turn on or off the locusulus. And it does this for heaps of different situations, right? Like it'll turn, it'll make endorphins and encephalins and things in different um, situations. It'll make gallon. And there's all these really fascinating things that the hypothalamus does. But I think that's one that's really quite interesting to think about, right? Like transcribing genes into protein products in order to create state changes that you would otherwise do if like, you know, like a, the locus realist decides to release some noradrenaline. Okay, cool. It does that. It's got it stored in a vesicle. Whereas this is like mm -hmm. this whole other processing. I know it's an interesting feature. So though. what you're saying is that it's a little bit more jack of all trades in terms of the neurons in the hypothalamus can like change what they, they release. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about the details of exactly where and when each of the different um, protein products can be transcribed. It was more the idea that there's this kind of like equipotentiality of the system that it can kind of like context dependent decide how it's going to respond. Like, so mm -hmm. the, the same pro opio melanocortin gene can um, either be turned into alpha MSH or gamma MSH or beta MSH, right? all these like downstream products. And if it, if there's other cofactors around, it just goes off and makes more cortisol releasing hormone, which then releases cortisol. And then you get mm -hmm. more adrenaline. Mm -hmm. and, but if there's a different cofactor, it says, hey, I think it's time to turn on the system for finding food. And so then you get, you know, alpha MSH going off. So there's this, I don't know, it's, it's just an interesting feature of the biology that- I don't Okay, think yeah. Oh, the, so there's the, another, the, there is another interesting feature, uh, Mac, uh, of the hypothalamus, especially the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? Which is that it's the only drain organ that can actually be grafted from one person to another. And it actually, like, you can- you can entrain someone else's circadian rhythm. You sound like Nick. Yeah, we, have, we don't have Nico here. So, so. On the one day that Nico is not here. <laughs> but yeah, um, the, the uh, yeah, so let's move on. So and, uh, yeah, so back to the paper. Um, the, uh, the, so again, kind of working backwards from, from now from the hypothalamus and from, from the amygdala, uh, you can say, well, which systems are most related to food? So that's the anatomical way of thinking, but obviously the lesions themselves will tell you a lot uh, and the cortex is the easiest to kind of, other than the, the orbital surface, uh, which is pretty hard to study actually, uh, and even to get to. Um, uh, so, so, and that's part, part of why um, uh, there was some, at least in my lab, a little bit of skepticism about the way the orbital surface was parcelated. Because um, you'll notice even in this diagram, uh, and which is the medial surface, there's no 25 uh, again. <laughs> so, so I, I'm a little mystified here. Um, but the basic story is that they divide up uh, the prefrontal cortex into these sub subnetworks, and the idea being that these subnetworks tend to project strongly to each other, um, and uh, they also share projections elsewhere. Um, so there's a orbital and medial prefrontal cortex, OMPFC, it's pretty non-standard, but it sort of overlaps with what a lot of imaging people call VMPFC, but not completely. And then under, under that, they have an orbital network and a medial network. And then on the lateral surface, which is here, um, you have a dorsal, a ventral, and a caudal. And for some reason, they just have area 45A on its own. I don't, I haven't, I haven't looked into this in detail. And, um, I don't know that much about lateral uh, prefrontal cortex myself because I've been so focused on these limbic areas. But uh, yeah, so the, these areas, they, they kind of argue that they overlap with um, the, the, at least the front half of the default mode network. And I have a, a slide on this. Uh, but, but yeah, basically uh, the, the connectivity, the, the fact that they are more integrated with each other and, how, and what they communicate with downstream kind of links them. So the amygdala, for instance, strongly. Yeah. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. So I think one thing that would be interesting, and there's there's at least one or two examples that have been done like that, but I don't know if 
how recently they have been redone is a lot of these networks make a lot of sense, but by and large, especially the ones that have been discussed for more than a decade or two, some of these are just, they have been talking about for, for a long time, is that if you collated all the available literature and, and made that a quantitative analysis, what, what kinds of things come out? I mean, it makes a lot of sense to parse things the way they suggest or make some sense to parse it the way they suggest, but can it be something that can be more quantitatively done if, because um, now we have the ability like Coco Mac and other kinds of databases to, to focus on these or even more network systems and and compare to different proposals. What's the extent that, 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 that this actually comes out of the data when you collate across all the literature or a large portion of the literature? It's a great question. I, and uh, I, can, I can almost hear the anatomist in my lab kind of saying, uh, because they've had this experience well in, in, in places, including Cocomac, there are errors in the database yeah. for a couple of different reasons. One is obviously just human uh, data entry errors. That, that, that happens. Mm -hmm. And um, like it's really a big problem, even in like the Allen Brain Institute and stuff like that. And 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 it's not always easy to parcelate error because you know the difference from one brain to the next is is is, is uh, like you need to be a trained anatomist to really know what you're doing. And if you don't uh, share exactly where the injection site is, yeah, other anatomists cannot harmonize you know, data A with data B, because if, if, if you just say I injected 25, it, it might not be, it might be on the edge of something that somebody else called, who calls area two, uh, for instance, yeah? mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that will make interpretation very difficult. Like yeah. if you happen to ca categorize part of 24, A or 32 or 25, you're going to get a bunch of inconsistent. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a little bit the same story with um, meta-analyses, right? I mean, if you put a bunch of studies that are really poor, what's going to come out of the meta-analysis is not, yeah. not very informative. <laughs> maybe but, you get artifacts but, of meta-averaging. <laughs> but maybe, maybe, maybe a, let's say, a biased uh, collection of data from some labs that trust each other. I don't know, you know, so that it uh, <laughs> so that it transcends one lab, but it, it's it's a set of labs that you know you talk to an anatomist and they have all this respect to other anatomists, right? And and maybe not everyone, but but so it's just like how do, how can we do this in a, a little bit more quantitatively because yeah. it's so qualitative, like it's. Okay, I'm going to emphasize certain kinds of connectivity because I, I have this model in my head, and it's tough because there's two reasons, right? One, one is that the anatomists are kind of a shrinking number of people in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the other is that there's this you know lump of litter issue among the anatomists, so they are not the most uh, uh, they don't agree that often. <laughs> so uh, the hope, I think, that like in our lab. There's a lot of hope, partly because it's consistent with their framework, is that the genetic profiling of, of cortical areas will really help with the uh, parcellation. Um, so that I think will happen for the mice and the rats eventually. And then, so it'll kind of go up the scale a little bit. It'll take a while to reach the macaque and it'll take a very long time for the humans. But um, but that's, a, and, and then I think like a little bit of what Paul, Paul Cisek is doing with his evolutionary perspective, like those are the things that will have to happen. And then as the MRI resolution increases and as you know, new, new techniques emerge, it'll have to be some sort of triangulation of all these different methods so, rather than just the old school anatomy um, mm -hmm. that we'll have to. But yeah, because it is really disappearing, right? I mean, it yep. might be, I mean, on its last legs, I mean, this kind of anatomy, right? This, yeah, this, yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of moved. To the whole new like Allen Allen Brain slash uh, you know uh, what's that uh, the European flagship project like the Blue Brain style way of anatomy not this kind of like very focused study uh, where I just say like I'm going to inject in this particular area yeah. see that's hardly the case maybe people uh, like our lab we have a separate histology section so we are okay I mean we are not all of us are anatomy no one is an anatomist in our lab but we have an anatomist in our lab. She does all the work for us. 
So we get to learn from it. But if you look outside what she does here at MIT, we don't have anyone. There are no anatomists. Uh, there are no anatomists. Oh, yeah. It's the new new style of anatomists, like the tracers and uh, yeah, the, I think not, it's, the viral injections and whatnot. Um, I think it's ending. Yeah, it really oh, is. Oh, you mean the opto? Opto, the opto based or whatever newer techniques, like, you know, they want to do like fancy new imaging techniques for all that rather than like, the right. old school stuff is on the vein. Um, the immunohistochemistry is actually a really cool method. Like, I, 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 like the way that it works, because the, the double labeling and triple labeling that you can do. Like you can ask whether like uh, you know a, a single cell is receiving uh, yeah. axons yeah. from two different areas. Like uh, like are there? Because and the interesting thing is that's such an important network question, right? It's like sure two uh, areas converge on area twenty five maybe, but it is entirely possible that they're picking out different cells. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Can change how you think about what the network, what the function of that area is. And and we do see some, a little bit of that, like slight segregation among the cells versus convergence. Um, so so it's um, yeah. something to keep in mind. Anyway. Louis, getting back to your question, like you, uh, even if we do like a meta analysis of like I don't know th thousands of studies out there, how like you still require some criteria, right? Like to actually like uh, say that this is indeed a good definition of- uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's actually one of the questions that I wanted to bring up, which is, 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 it, is it, for instance, one of the things that you, I don't know if I marked enough here, but uh, so we have, it's, we have this hyper complex and complicated system of connectivity and, and so we try to impose some order by looking at some regularities. But by definition, we're doing some kind of dimensionality reduction here and emphasizing some main directions and some main hmm. systems of some sort, right? So, and I think with our biases, maybe it's a good thing or maybe not, but if we, we, we tend to de-emphasize certain properties that are not so central to the, the model that we're using, we're, we're coming up with, right? So for instance, let me, one example that I was marking here was that I actually, I didn't, I didn't know that, that the, um, there are dorsal areas in prefrontal cortex, I didn't remember this, maybe I knew from, knew from before, that, that there, there's output from these dorsal areas directly to hypothalamus and PAG. Right. So, I have no idea. Yeah. And so it goes a little bit like there's this paper from 71, I think, where is it 69 by Nauta. Oh. And, and the, the, the paper says, if we're going to define limbic as everything that is connected to the hypothalamus, <laughs> that is the whole brain. <laughs> and so his point is that that's completely a vacuous way of defining it, which is historically how people since the Papis circuit uh, have sort of focus on the limbic system. And, and so his argument is that all of prefrontal cortex is pretty much, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much co connected with it. And, and so this is actually something that I think that others have looked in, 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 in primates too. And Swanson has looked in, in, in my, in mice and, and rats. And he suggests that the thalamus is, 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 is proposed as this, this place that is connected to lots of cortex, right? Obviously, by almost definition, it's, it's just connected massively to cortex. But a second system that is also massively connected to cortex is hypothalamus. In, in one of the papers that Swanson develops, like these gigantic treatments of everything in the brain, like this mega models of architecture and whatnot. So again, we emphasize some, maybe they're a little stronger, they, maybe they're a lot stronger. I don't know, but that's why I, I wanted a little bit more quantitative assessment so that we get a better handle of how important are these connections from lateral and lateral parts of, of PFC directly to hypothalamus and PAG, for instance. Yeah. Because if they're really, they are really functional, then we shouldn't be only talking about the medial PFC having access directly to hypothalamus and, 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 
and PAG, for instance, and, and other regions. So that's the part that I, I, I get, you know, so I kind of emphasize, I, I always tend to emphasize those because they are less emphasized, but that's my own bias, right? So I'm picking up on those and emphasizing those just because I want to give counter examples and say that it's more integrated. So it's oh, my bias is, okay, it's all, it's, it's a lot more integrated than people are talking about. So, but that's also a bias because I mean, pretty much without some quantification, it's, it's going to be biased. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, you can definitely look like just uh, the issue with comparing injections is also that from one injection to the next, the uptake is different. So it's difficult to compare two different injections in two different uh, animals or two different cases. So you have to look at the relative proportion in a given injection. Uh, and then you can, you can sort of uh, like over time, you can learn that, okay, the amygdala to MD is a super strong projection. And then relative to that, if, if you've already, so because you, you know, if it's a retrograde, you can look at all the different projections. You can say, I know that this one's strong. So relative to that, if this is much less, I can say it's it's a weak one. So those things you can do, but it's it's, it's possible, but it needs a lot of like you know, like conventions, like, you know, some sort of I right, program. But, but then there's the, the functional, the structural and functional coupling and decoupling, right? Because it, it, it can be a very strong, a very strong anatomical connection pretty much means that there's gonna be some really good room for in, important functional interactions there. But the converse is not so clear cut, right? So when we, yeah. we're not very good at understanding the, the, the contributions of weak, weak contributions, weak connections, weak, when they're massive, there's room for massive amounts of weak things. How do systems behave, right? So we're very good yeah. as like, you take a hammer and I, yeah, that's actually gonna crash this 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 screen here and it's going to break to break but how about other kinds of weak contributions that simultaneously can coalesce and 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 so we're not very good at that so we don't know how to if we threshold then it could be that we it's fine but maybe in some contexts the the weaker things do take a much larger functional role I, really like I keep it. looking for examples like that to kind of just like remind myself that that can happen too. And so yeah. again, that's the, the, the bias that we bring into the discussions is that to say, to remind that the weak contributions might not be weak after all. Maybe they are, but we, we just don't know. It's a great point. Good at that. Yeah. I, I, just bother, I think about this a lot because uh, when you were trying to step away from this engineer mindset, right, where there's these modular units that perform computations, right? Like, the one thing that's staring you in the face is from the engineer's perspective, how messy the brain is, right? There's like, yes, it, things go here to there, but there's also this other sort of weird spray of connections uh, and things that seem to miss their target. And you can't help but wonder if something distinctive about uh, what the brain is doing is because of all those um, sort of uh, outside, coloring outside the lines, you know, that like that. So yeah, I love that. That's a be really, I don't know, I wonder, how, I have no idea how one would study that, but it would be so good. Um, okay, um, so they dive into, like you said, the, the cortical projections type of elements, which the, the ones that people talk about are mostly from the medial surface and the orbital surface. And um, uh, yeah, in fact, one of our Helen's recent papers was about uh, projections from, I think, 25 to, to hypothalamus, and there was a very interesting structure to it. Uh, it might have been 32 though. Um, uh, so yeah, so there's this focus on like, visceral activation. And and this is a classic point uh, Damasio made uh, about these kind of cortical counterparts to um, amygdala and, and lower lower layers. Some people give Damasio a hard time about the book and the title of it. He called it Descartes' Error, the, the pop book on this. But uh, when, when um, people... Uh, to either have severe lesions of the medial prefrontal cortex or amygdala, they can often seem normal and can be they can perform cognitive tasks when they're asked to, but they they like do not self-generate decisions. So so they're severely debilitated in terms of making choices, and yeah, so this is really interesting, right? Not understanding the long-term significance of their actions, and choosing the short-term stuff. So this is like I often bring this up in this sort of Cognition versus emotion thing, which uh, people 
will often like try and get away from that. But then it's almost like it's some weird attractor that uh, after having acknowledged this, people go back to the idea that you need to kind of get rid of emotion. Um, but it's so it's like hard for people to understand the idea that cognition and emotion are are like interacting, like almost like two parts of a pair of scissors or something. Um, uh, I thought this was an interesting. Here. Yeah. Can I can I just a little a bit provocative question? So so Louise, I think you've argued quite um persuasively that the distinction between cognition and emotion is a bit of a silly one. I, I think if you you're right, if you look, look down at the neurobiology, it's very hard to kind of find this partition. But I guess the question is how how should we be thinking about recategorizing behaviors or actions or uh, let's say just like, you know, plans or something that have more of what we would feel was an emotional quality versus more of a kind of cold quality. Like are, are there satisfying ways in your mind to, to reframe this so that we can still put these problems as in a sort of uh, in the crosshairs as it were? Cause you know, if, if I want to, for example, if I want to like get annoyed at my son for making mm -hmm. a decision based yeah. on or not, you know, he just, his brother just beat him in a game. That's yeah. him being a little bit emotional versus him saying, well, actually in the broader scheme of things, we're all going to win more. It'll be more fun. That's a little bit more of a kind of reappraisal cognitive mode, right? But maybe those aren't the right terms. So anyway, I'll stop talking. I'm, I'm curious to hear. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't have a huge problem. And that's, I think that's the funny, that's the, the, the tricky part. We're, in language, right? So it's 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 like, for instance, it's this funny thing. Like if you take um, so think how think think how law works, right? The like a legal contract or so they have some statements, and then they they make some statements, and they they have they need thirty pages to explain what exactly those statements mean, right? And what they don't mean. It doesn't mean that you can get a second warranty if you crash it three times, whatever. And also it, it has to explain everything, right? In 30 pages of minute text. So when we speak, I don't have a problem with speaking like in, the, in those terms, because I think that makes a lot of sense and, and that's just very natural. But I think that as scientists, we use that way of speaking and we don't go into lawyer mode. I'm not sure why exactly I decided to talk about lawyers today for, for the first time in my life, but as if that was a good thing. But we don't go into this minute, let's say, um, itemization of everything we mean and we don't mean in a sense that we, so we create a language that is all about making these contrasts as if they were dichotomous, as if they were independent, as if they were separate from one another. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about an Eastern type of tradition, but Western tradition is all about that, right? Like these terms that are, that are, they're not interrelated. They're not circling back onto themselves in some ways that, that, that uh, maybe other worldviews emphasize more so i think that's the problem that i have it's 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 all this way of describing things in, in almost this segregationist and separationist and isolationist manner by definition and and not so every time i i say some of these things people say oh but that's not what we mean we mean is that we didn't mean that and okay but you've been talking in a certain way that really feels that way really strongly. So I get accused of that all the time. We didn't mean that. We didn't mean that. We didn't mean that. And so over a beer after colloquium, they explain what they really mean. And we are much, much, much closer. Right. But in the talk, they say it's like one is aware and unaware. One is automatic. One is controlled. One is top down. One is, you know, you know one is top, one is, is top down and bottom up and whatnot is so which one is it? So I, I, I have this problem with complaining about all of these more dichotomized views. 
again, I don't have a problem. There is some sense in which many of these things make sense to say it's more controlled versus more automatic. It's more this versus that. It, it's not a problem. But I think we get into a language that we're not very good. I don't know if any humans can be better or could be, but it's just that the language that we use is, is, is really doesn't invite any nuance. It's almost like, it's almost like, let's say we, let's, let's say we want to do philosophy and we're really sloppy with our language. I mean, not to idealize philosophy in, in any way, but because they can also write some things that seem much more formalized and, and it's just circular or whatever, or just claiming that it is, but but it's, it seems that we, we use some, something in a really care, a careless manner. And then so it just invites, in, invites certain ways of thinking about the brain that, and, and about behavior that I, I think are, are really problematic. So instead of looking at how does this thing emerge in terms of why does it have this cognitive, emotional, motivational flavor this interaction between the kids has this flavor versus another flavor and what leads to it. That's, I think, a much better way of, of, of thinking about, which is how does it have this nuance? It, it's like food as well, right? So why, when you mix these 19 spices, it becomes this really amazing thing and you're interested in that combination and the, the spices don't work by themselves. Sometimes you put way too much one spice and it actually overwhelms the other. So no one is going to deny that, oh, it was really salty tonight. I'm sorry. And it was like, I just overdid it. I just got it wrong. And it was terrible. That, there's no denying that there can be that kind of thing, right? But it's the combination is also what makes food food. And I don't know if the brain is like that, but in a sense... We need to look at, we, we, it's more about what attracts me is always a combination of things. And to, it seems that a lot of people are more attracted by the um, atomization of things. You know, I, I, it's, it's a bunch of atoms and I'm going to break them into atoms and the atoms spend the space or add up to this amount or do this. And so... I keep hammering on the let's combine things and see how the combinations come and the combinations are context dependent and dynamic mm -hmm. and this and that. And so, yeah. The, um, the, the, the spiced rub analogy I think is great because people can really intuit that, right? They, you can, you can notice some things off with the flavor, but you, maybe you can't put your finger on it or, you know, it's, sometimes it's really obvious. Oh, wow. There's way too much salt. But other times you're like, I don't know. I just don't like the taste of it or something. Yeah. And there are all these interesting, complicated, I don't know how to say it, probably shapes that the spice can take. Um, and yet, you know, just saying that it's to this or that is a bit silly. It's missing. It's like not accurately describing the. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it, it doesn't make, yeah, it doesn't make for a final amazing thing. Or, I mean, you take this where, when, really good chefs really i mean that's their passion right so how do you put these things together in some unique ways that oh yeah. okay, you have this yeah we've eaten indian food for millennia this way and whatnot but let's create something slightly different and mix it with other flavors and see and you know, i'm creating this this new thing and, and how do you do that and and so it, it's the mixing and the mixing that I, I find attractive in a way that because it seems that behavior is so rich and context depending that you're always mixing in this kind of really dynamic and, 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 and context dependent way to solve the problems that you're faced with at any given time. And, and so as an external observer, you can clearly say that Oh, at that point, you know, the, in the in the chase, the wild dogs went into some more chaotic mode and just just attacked. And you know, the other ones, they seem more coordinated and more cognitive, and they were really like circling in some coordinated fashion. I think externally, we can make all those things, and they map to something internal too. If we were to record all their brains simultaneously, they would be doing something different from 
I don't know, something else happens and they have to either scatter or just crash into a new animal that appears. And so, yeah, that's not to deny that there, there's, there isn't a mapping, but. I really like should... this whole conversation because like I was riffing on this, like initially I was like, why is Luis talking about legal contracts? But now like, so it, I feel like it's a really important sociological point that, that Louise has made, which I really think we, we should like pause on a sec, because like, what's the point of science if we're just reproducing cultural biases that already exist? Like we already live in a society where for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, people have made this distinction, particularly in the West, between being calm, cool and rational and being emotional. And it comes with all this baggage of sexism and like, even the way that uh, colonialism proceeded and, and how we are uh, expected to behave in the workplace. So there's many, many aspects of this that we are just regurgitating uh, in, our, in the brain. And in some, on some level, it's just phrenology, right? We're seeing things that we already know about that are like rational, happy, this, that, and the other. And we're just looking for them in the brain rather than looking for, because like what, like there's this dumb kind of explanation that we constantly see in science, which is like, you're sad because the sadness area was activated, but that's not an explanation of anything. <laughs> like it, it, it tells you absolutely nothing about, about the brain, about sadness. So this combination idea, I, I, I first kind of intuited something along these lines when I was thinking about uh, subtractive methods in fMRI. So I was, look, I was looking around for, like, I, I was feeling some discomfort and I wanted to create some metaphors to explain to other people why they need to be wary about subtractive methods. And the easy thing is this, like if you have, imagine a network where there's these th like 10 nodes and there are these three nodes in the middle that are like the linchpin of the network and they participate in every single phenomenon equally, okay? They're like really integrative. Now, if you do a subtraction, that those things get canceled out uh, <laughs> of, 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 and yeah. all you see are like the, the bit players. Um, so this is a real risk that that is that we are almost guaranteed guilty of uh, even in our own work you know like and and so like so what happens is, well, how will you fix this like you have you have to ask like like with this integration thing right that like if if they're not orthogonal elements cognition and thinking then it's almost like this one single stretchy object right where pulling in one part pulls everything some in a different way so if you start to think about more interesting phenomenology like Sad people are not only the people who are going around bawling and crying all the time, right? You can be walking down the street with a kind of half smile on your face and internally feeling quite sad, right? Or uh, you could be making a rational argument in some debate, which is backed by some fury, you know, where you're actually trying to cut down somebody, you know, but it all sounds like, like uh, a nice, neat, rational uh, debate, right? Mm -hmm. And we, by virtue of that not fitting neatly into the task paradigms, because half the time people aren't even interested in that. They're never going to find correlates of angry math, you know, like who, who would ever uh, look for it? Uh, but mm -hmm. when you're joking around with somebody, you get irritated with somebody, you might be making a rational argument, but the context in which you're making it has this affective uh, component, like either to blow off steam or to make somebody else feel bad. Like there's all these uh, things that happen. That, and, and we like sell ourselves short when we, we don't even acknowledge the kinds of things that we know about in hu in hu in the human experience. Uh, when we so so it's like it's like saying, and what what you said about um, legal language. The reason I thought about all this was for informal purposes. It's okay to be in subtractive mode. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. that we all get to live in the same society, and we can take many things for granted. So it's like when I say pass the salt, I don't have to tell you what salt is. Uh, in if we are in the same community, right? But that's not science. That's just coping. <laughs> that's just coping with society. So, so for us, we have to do the much more difficult job of the of the lawyer in the sense that we have to make everything explicit. Like, like, and if we haven't done that yet, then we just have to say we apologize that for these placeholders, but we would we don't want to hide the fact that some of the things that we're doing are placeholder. We should say it like. I'm working on this bit here. For now, I'm going to invoke higher order cortical processing because I have no other choice for now. You know, so I really like this this uh, the whole legal contracting because it really gets to how scientists can like we let everybody down 
if we just use yeah. whatever cliches are floating around. Yeah? yeah, I'm really okay with the placeholders. It's mm -hmm. not what drives me crazy is, is when I get confused in the sense that they it seems that they're that's what they really mean. It's not a placeholder. So again, if you push, they say no, 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 no. And it, I, I, I'm, you know, so you get accused of saying things that you're making people. It's oh, they, people are naive or what have you. Or yeah, so it's 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 really difficult. I just I just don't know because it's almost like language doesn't help. It's it sort of gets a little bit in the way because we have to. What is language? But having these placeholders and putting them together, and I mean, what was the last time that anyone read a thirty-page contract of something? I don't know. Maybe some people do. I can't. I mean, you know. So, and yeah, I think it's a great point. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just the other day, I threw out and told my wife, "We're not going to read this, are we?" And it's like, no. We're not. Anyway. Um, just to get back to this, um, we don't have to go through the whole thing. But um, but yeah, there was a couple of sort of odd little theoretical points being made in the middle of the anatomy that I thought, oh, what, what is this doing here? Uh, <laughs> so um, so to account for some deficits, Demacio had this semantic marker hypothesis. That's that's fine. And um, so the subconscious. So there's this idea of serving as a subconscious warning or guide, indicating some behaviors are disadvantageous. Fine. Again. Um, whether it's conscious or not, it doesn't matter too much, but um, I thought this was interesting. The full basis for this effect is probably complex, and uh, collateral projections they involve um, the direct visceral projection and sensations of resulting visceral reactions. Collateral projections that provide as-if circuits, which could give a warning without necessitating sensory awareness. Um, so it's sort of thrown in there, but that's like a, there's a lot to kind of expand on that, which I like actually. But but it's surprising to see it in this context. But because it seems like uh, related to concepts like vicarious trial and error, or or like uh, like virtual like exploring possibility space virtually or something like that, right? Like, um, but why it has to do like why the why it would need to be unconscious is is strange but it's true like like sometimes you can start like when when we talk about vibes or something right like somebody starts to feel discomfort but they don't know why um like uh, it's interesting to put that in there but um yeah it's 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 funny though i i mean again it's it's Damasio's original framework the as as if part seems to be a little bit out of context and a little, but I, I maybe I'm misremembering because it's been a while that I read more carefully. But, but uh, it, it's, I mean, basically, is 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 talking about the um, the central argument of of at least one of the the original descriptions of these kind of gut feelings and and contributing to decision making, right? So you, I think one of the examples, I don't know if it's from a from the book itself or from a Gazaniga textbook it, it talks about you imagine going to to a basketball arena but the last time you went you it was icy the road and you almost went off the road and you decide not to go to the next basketball game and you don't know exactly why you decided not to go because you had this bad experience previous previously but you know your decision making as to what you're going to do what am I going to do this weekend? It's like some rational decision making when I'm going to go to my favorite sports event, and that gets integrated with this gut feeling of some negative ex prior experience. Mm. I don't remember this as if part as related to this, but I'm, maybe I'm misremembering. But I just I was struck by this idea that one can think about all this based on circuitry, <laughs> which is which is. Like what it made me think of is that how it's actually hard not to do it. It's like sort of you're reading a whole lot of, of functional kind of information into a circuit. Um, well, with this circuitry like, idea here, sorry, Johan, the circuitry idea here is is because again of the the Masio group proposal that it comes with this OFC VM ventral medial PFC lesion lesions, and so I think they 
they stick here in this this part here it's talking about subgeneral cortex in a way that is that is a little funny because it was more like this general circuit that was 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 impairing this type of decision making that can be mm. guided by emotion and guided by emotion right by these okay. kinds of more positive versus negative prior experiences that might bias you one one way yeah i'm going to go to this sports arena why not or no i'm not going to go because the last time was also snowing and you know i had a almost bad act i really almost right, had right. a bad accident or something what i whenever i come across this sort of thing what i like about it is this idea that like if you start from the assumption that you have this huge uh, array of both um, episodic memories and like uh, associative memories which are more just like uh, appetitive and aversive associ associations the great difficulty with you know look ahead planning and all that stuff is to to kind of constrain it so i like this idea that that which we often think of when we think of as a, a kind of cognitive thing which is like we use some good reasoning to constrain based on context and information but what i like here is the idea that that constraint story starts at the emotional level and which can be both good and bad. Like if you have an optimism bias, right? When you imagine what will happen when you go to some place, you think about good things that can happen. Um, and that could come from, you know, this type of structure potentially. Um, that, that the, so, and from a human perspective, you could say that what initially might have evolved to assess the present and the past and do near term kind of prediction uh, now gets extrapolated quite, quite wildly. And in the case of, of um, depressed people, like you know, you're stuck imagining all, all these things that have been tagged, um, you know, with uh, or marked with with, with aversive uh, expectations. I yeah, think like, Tommaso. Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think I think Tommaso. I think I'm almost sure that he explicitly discusses it in terms of this, like exactly like you did this process of cutting the search and and making right. because otherwise okay. you know. If you, you can spend uh, the whole your whole life putting pros and cons, right? So, yeah. and some some people are very prone to that. Like literally, I yes. have, have a friend who used to make lists and I of pros and cons, and so and and so this this mechanism just does cuts that much more efficiently in a sense, given yeah, yeah. that you can't decide. And 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 what's fun about it, and almost like kind of like compared to all this sort of neural net, artificial neural networky information geometry stuff right it's like we here we're potentially saying that the limbic system which people think of as all wishy-washy emotion stuff is actually doing this huge job of whittling down the state space which i think is, a, is like crucial and and um like a fun topic anyway um, so yeah the um, the they, they were the front half of the default mode network seems to overlap with what they're labeling as the medial prefrontal network. So Mac, <laughs> what exactly, so is there a, a clear like agreement on what's in the default mode network? I always get like uh, confused um, uh, and about what's in it. Um, yeah, I mean, the default mode kind of ends up being a little bit of a catch-all term for many different things. Um, the history of it is kind of informative in that um, people were doing what you mentioned the other, just before about essentially like doing some subtract subtractive um, uh, neuroscience, right? They would get people to do two different tasks, subtract them away and then say, oh, look, I found the function and the difference, but that removed the core of what was going on um, in the middle of all of it. And oftentimes that would be default mode structures. In fact, they found it in, um, in, a, in a weird way where they, <laughs> they showed that actually the default mode was consistently negatively associated with doing really focused tasks. Like that forced you to like track something around your environment or really, you know, think about a calculation really deeply. Something that was sort of like an external visual motor task, right. the default mode would kind of dropped down. And so the group that uh, discovered that, you know, quote unquote, uh, and kind of made it famous, then did a study showing that um, at rest, there was an increased use of oxygen uh, what they call an oxygen ejection fraction in PET imaging in those same structures. And so then they called it the default mode. And they said, maybe this is, you know, when you're lying down doing nothing in a scanner and you're kind of like, you know, conscious of your own thoughts, maybe there's something like that's what's going on here. And 
people got really excited thinking about kind of Freudian notions of <laughs> ego and super ego and all these kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, fast not, forward, yeah. Sorry, go on. Connectivity wise, like like some of it, like 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 the, like the point of this book paper kind of is that this front half of it uh, does uh, connect with like in, interoception. Um, but like, I have no idea what to We're make. We're really just it. talking about like this part, right? But, but yeah, so um, this part is is linked to interoception. But what are we supposed to say about the you know the the the? But Johan, uh, I have a question. Part. Yeah, I, I have a question also for for Mac, which was pretty amazing when I saw first, and I I hadn't seen it in in literature before. Which was if you go back to one of the figures that they show with these large circles of the, the connectivity of the media. Yeah. So I, I was, I was amazed at, at when they, when they drew, when they drew here on the, in the top, right, that mm. it, this medial network was really highly overlapping with, um, with a default network that people talk in. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I was, I was like, I don't remember seeing people discussing and linking it with this the, this price uh, type of no. network. I, and I was, I'm wondering if um, I just missed it or I haven't seen people talking about this link. I think there's ships passing in the night, Lewis. I think. Yeah. Um, right. About these yeah. things very much. Because there, there was a study recently by um, Mikel Thibault de Schotten's group in Paris that um tried to track the sort of subcortical structures of the default mode network, right? So, you know, half of the problem here, right, is that people have only looked at the cortex and they'll just throw everything else out and they'll say, ah, oh, the default mode has these hubs in medial prefrontal and posterior singular, as well as these other satellites or something. Yeah. But they're yeah. all caught satellites. Yeah. Um, and if you track down into the subcortex, a lot of the structures they were talking about in this paper, you know, like the pericoductal gray and the hypothalamus and the basal forebrain, end up being a medial um, dorsal nucleus, all those things end up being a part of their kind of, you know, broader network. So it's in part, it's like people haven't been looking in the right place, but I, I don't think the people that read price read, you know, uh, Reichel. I just don't, I, th I think the overlapping Venn diagrams are probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ex yeah. So it <laughs> seems like a connection that should be made because I'm looking at the default network in a completely different way now. <laughs> like I'm like, whoa. Yeah. What's this paper that you that you said? I mean, is that possible to share the 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 yeah 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 this so last one the that you mentioned? Here's the subcortical one here. Um, I just put in the chat. And the, okay. the other one that I quite like um, is from Randy Buckner, um, and they kind of have this thing they call the uh, what is it? The fractionation of the brain's default network, and they kind of um, they link out the kind of core, what they call, which is the medial prefrontal and the posterior cingulate, or oh, the precuneus nodes. And then they kind of they have these two different sub networks. One of them they call a kind of medial temporal lobe network, which is the hippocampus and the internal cortex and the peri perihippocampal areas and some of the subgenual anterior cingulate. And then they have this kind of dorsal medial prefrontal sub network, which is more associated with superior frontal gyrus, um, temporal parietal junction, a couple areas in the superior, uh, in the, um, superior temporal sulcus. But the point of it is that they attribute loosely this kind of no notion that the default mode is kind of the system that can kick on when you've got no threats around you. And then what, what do you do when you've got no threats around you? You either kind of think about something that's happened before, you're going to use your hippocampus and you're going to like tap back into previous things, or you're going mm -hmm. to prospect about what could happen next. And to do that, you need areas like the temporal parietal junction, the superior temporal uh, frontal gyrus, et cetera. And you could think about the default mode as kind of like uh, the other two core areas is sort of like arbitrating between this balance of like past and future mm -hmm. and, and being able to kind of like almost like chew on all options, you know, going back to what you've done before, thinking about what might happen. And so it actually kind of links really nicely with some of the discussions we're having earlier about like how you would even differentiate between what we would call kind of emotional or hot thinking versus cold or cognitive thinking. It's a little bit like, in emotional thinking, you're kind of jumping to conclusions, right? You're developing a high amount of confidence either on something that's happened to you before or how mm -hmm. you guess something will happen, right? We just quickly, uh, someone cut me off. Oh, I hate them. They must, mm -hmm. you know, they must think that I'm a pathetic weenie and they can own the road. And then as you were saying, Johan, then you get the context of they have the pregnant woman in the back seat and you pull all the evidence together and then you make your confident decision based on 
prospecting, oh, they would have to go and get to the hospital. That's more important than me getting ice cream from the store or something like that. So I, I like this idea of like, almost like that playing out with mm -hmm. the default mode of kind of like a key structure in the decision-making um, as it unravels over time. Do you quickly jump to conclusions or do you collect all the evidence? And th so the reason I wanted to bring up the history, right, is that when default mode came up originally, people always thought of it as this passive thing, like the system <laughs> that kicks on not doing something. Right, right, right. Wrong, right. It's it's just not kicking on when you do the shit boring tasks that people designed yeah, in the yeah. 90s <laughs> on the MRI scanner, right? Yeah. It, it, it's doing emotional decision-making. It's doing complex um, you know, prospection and introspection and, and you know, um, chewing on problems. Like these are really gnarly things that we care about a lot as neuroscientists, I think. What but we basically, just kind of put them to the side. It's like basically like what I can do to while away my time when these guys are absolutely making me not do yeah. anything. <laughs> exactly, 100%. So I, I totally thought this for, for a while. Like ever since I saw what was in the default mode network, I was like, oh, and in fact, Kale hates the term default uh, uh, network. He always says, let's not call it that. And I was like, let's just call it the ruminative network. Because that's <laughs> really what we're talking about, right? It's the ruminative network. And what's interesting uh, like um, about this is this idea that you need, that you can't be constantly ruminating for whatever reason. Uh, <laughs> some, some sort of um, bottleneck. That's your neck uh, what do you mean, yeah. whatever reason? If you're ruminating, you if the world oh, changes, I mean, you won't. <laughs> the, well, the the world, doing the exact thing which I was talking about, which is the world distracts our, you um, too much. We, we're using our normal intuition to say, yeah, yeah sure, that's natural. But like, the, the wider question is, why is there a bottleneck? Because there isn't a bottleneck for certain kinds of sensory experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Like they all happen to me at the same time, you know? So, the, the 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 interesting thing here is like when when we we're talking about when Mac mentioned the easy fMRI tasks, I was thinking, how would you um, get evidence of something like a task, like an actual thing where you need to be in the moment? So the task on network needs to be engaged, but also room, like you need to kind of step out into episodic memory or something. And this image I, I had, I, I've been watching lectures and I noticed this, and I do this too, which is when someone asks me a question and I need and I don't have an immediate answer. I will, I need to think, right? And very often the eyes go somewhere. Like you, you look up. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And and I find this very fascinating. And this could potentially uh, make us, like give us something to talk about with superior colliculus and cognition. Uh, 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 eyes yeah, go right. up, go some ahead. people have their tongues out. Right. <laughs> all all oh, those things. Water, he's playing basketball, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I was, I mean, this is wildly speculative, right? But I was thinking that, that uh, one way to think about um, how we like hijack our own modes is like shifting your gaze is, a, is like a mini version of changing context, right? Like, and uh, so you can, you can and, and when context changes, we have plenty of evidence that hippocampal formation in Tlamo is brought online, right? And one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is how those projections from the hippocampus and interrhinal mainly hippocampus uh, CA1 subiculum, two medial prefrontal, two uh, accumbens can help with this context shifting. So if it's the case that that while I'm in the middle of some particular argument I, and you ask me something that I do know about, but it's slightly irrelevant to what I've loaded up just now. You're like, hey, Johan wants for dinner. And I'd be like, oh, hang on a minute. Like, so, uh, and literally your eyes, like, so that, that might be my uh, hack other people like like they said use the tongue or something like that i mean it's it's related right the, the point with with respect to rumination right why there is a bottleneck that is like unlike say our sensory system which seems to have that automatic mode it's almost like a contingency issue right like exactly the point that you made which is that if i have i, have, I am ruminating on a problem and i need there might be tasks that are actually irrelevant for me to pay attention to or even work on on the other hand, as you said, like there might be a context switch or something that builds up suddenly where I have to be like, I have to break away from this rumination and go elsewhere. So it's sort of like the, the bottleneck is on purpose, not automatic in the sense that you have to deliberate for lack of a better word <laughs> before you break from the rumination and then switch to that task. And I think that mm. is on purpose. You should, we don't want it to be automatic because if that's the case, then uh, we will not be doing anything else but ruminate, right? So it's a <laughs> <laughs> so this I think is again a jump, right? But I I get the feeling that as we get 
to the high dimensions of like planning and cognition, whatever. It's so high dimensional, you know, integrating all these different things that um, the, some sort of sparsification on the fly needs to happen. So uh, like, like when we think of bottleneck, we think of it as a bad thing. But if we flip that around and say that we're trying to actually create sparsification, which is to like, um, and I, I think that there's anatomical evidence for this as an increasing thing in humans. Like uh, Klaus Hilgetag and one of his colleagues um, uh, kind of pointed that out. And, and I was thinking that in addition to kind of anatomical sparsification, if you can like separate networks out and say first this, then that, you know, mm -mm. Uh, that will kind of really uh, help you. And so, so it's like, think of bottleneck as, as like a way of navigating high dimensional spaces. Um, is is yeah. what I was thinking. I think that's I think that's spot on, man. Yep. I think um, yep. it's about corralling the mm -hmm. troops mm -hmm. so that they're on the same. What's the word? Like the same part of the Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like mm. when you when you raised that idea before about someone suggesting an idea that kind of like percolated along, you've got to make an arbitration now. Do I stay in the moment, focusing on the conversation and all of the complex machinery that's rolling forward? That's like taking it, you know, where's your plan of your conversation going? How does this relate to what someone said before? You know, and then you've got this other thing percolating along. You've got this valuation to make now. Do I care more about this conversation or the thing that's happened? And it could be a salient thing or it could be a slow burner. And you're constantly having to make this valuation. You know, you might not do it consciously, but it's always yeah. playing out. And and you've got to kind of almost in a way decide which way to lean to allow either of these things to happen. It's really fascinating to think about right because like sometimes we do it um automatically like driving the car on the way home you just kind of value the conversation that you're having in the car more over the over the, the steering wheel you don't spend any time thinking about it but it still plays along so i don't know there's a lot of really cool shit going on here but it's a like yeah. what a fun way to think about what brains are doing right they're like yeah. you've got these resources to bring to bear on a problem and you've got to make this valuation over time how you balance all of that yeah yeah so, so, yeah, so, uh, so Mac, uh, uh, on this, uh, I think when you guys were drawing something on the next figure with that, uh, with the default mode or something, uh, oh, yeah. is the is the insular cort and the, I think you know, Johan mentioned about interception and all that. So is the insular cortex part of this default mode network? Yeah, this is one of the things I can never figure out. Not, not typically. So the what the the kind of key regions that people will talk about uh, this the second link that I I put up will have a slightly better diagram of this, but they'll they'll call the like sort of the ventromedial prefrontal regions here and the and the precuneus the core. Um, and then the areas they'll have they'll have like a medial temporal lobe um, subsystem that's usually I'm trying to remember where else it's like part of the temporal pole, I think. Mm. Um, this, some other structures can you see this? Well. Yeah. He's drawing on oh, yeah. Oh, oh good, 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 good. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Perfect. Yeah, 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 great. So then, um, yeah, do do what you just had. Then that was that was great. Oops, um, right. went to something else. Initially, you had it for a while. Yeah, I can then... see part of the screen, not entirely. Yeah, got it. Yeah, you got it now. Yeah, that that's the perfect figure there. So the yellow regions are the ones they'll call the core. Oh, there I you see. go. There you go. I was wrong. It's the anterior medial prefrontal they've called it, and then the VMPFC, which I think is more consistent with what the price have called the the part of the default is part of this um, medial temporal lobe subsystem that they associate it with episodic memory and recall. And then you have this more deliberative DMPFC, lateral temporal, temporal parietal and temporal parietal junction structures that are in, uh, involved in um, prospection. And so, mm. and, you know, they often say things like theory of mind in the blue sub sub regions rather than the green. Um, but insular, so, not typically. People talk about the um, anterior insular and the salience network and the amygdala and the locus cerulis as being... Because the, the people have actually done all these studies with these meditation people and all that. They've shown that, that it's their insula that lights up the most and whatnot. Their insula has like also uh, higher connectivity. I don't know what they, what they exactly did. They actually showed that... Uh, but yeah, I'm very surprised. This is really interesting. They, they, they typically put that as part of the interoception area, yeah. but it seems to be not involved in the default mode. So oh, this like, is great. Karthik, you know what, what that is? again, I'm just speculating here, but like, this is really cool because what if rumination is not 
the be all and end all of introspection. So, or let's say it, let's say it differently. There are there can be much more high quality interoception among meditation. Like like and it's like that cliche: getting in touch with your feelings, right? Like fretting um, or doing like that sort of thing is not the same as getting in touch with your feelings. So mm-hmm. so like learning how to be sensitive to what's happening in your body is not the same as like going over all your episodic. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I think I think the insula is definitely insula is definitely involved in the former than in the latter. Yeah, yeah. That that's is what the- I'm saying. So it's kind of interesting that it isn't part of the same network because, and you could even argue that it's a it's a sort of rare state for a lot of people, mm-hmm. not for everybody. But but like I was talking to somebody recently about different somatic styles or some, some sort of how people identify with their body, and some people just live here. They're like all head, and like they don't think about their body at all to the point of neglecting it. And then there are other people who are like very much sort of living in the body. So it would be interesting to want to know if if there's a individual differences uh, even in, in among healthy people uh, about how much the insula comes online or how often. Yeah, there was a there was a pain. I I remember only the figure. I don't remember the the paper and the title. This was like a PNAS uh, paper from a few years back, or maybe even ten years back, where they had this image of like uh, they mapped. They did exactly this kind of mapping that you were talking about, Johan, where they were like talking about like where do people see about about their body where is their oh. body located they had like these two images distinctly i remember one in blue and the other in red the, on the body where the people with the body thing uh, the upper body stuff like they were saying like the, the body is located here or something and for the others it's like all over like uh, the rest of the people who like care about their arms and what's happening it's like red all over it was, what's the paper i can't i don't even send know it, how to it. search yeah, I'll be, I'll be, i don't I'll even know how it. to search it <laughs> Yeah, sense of self. Anyway, it's only like ten thirty. So should we like just move on and talk about them? Like talk about the rest of this later? Or? Yeah. Um, so just just but, to put a final cap on your your question about this stuff, um, the ways in which the different networks interact with one another mm-hmm. are outside of the real focus. And I put the insular as one of those fascinating kind of more kind of connector hub style areas, mm-hmm. right? Where there's tons of different networks over, overlapping and it's hard to know what the precise rules are. The, the posterior cingulate they have here, this kind of temporal parietal, uh, parietal operculum area is another one of those junctions. Uh, the, you know, the precunus as well, really interesting zones where multiple different networks, you know, in this way of labeling things intersect. And so to me, they're, they're the places we ought to be thinking about how is it that you arbitrate between external and internal world or something like that? Like, should mm-hmm. I focus on tracking an item around or think about the last time I caught it if I want to achieve the goal of catching a ball? And it, it's an interesting, I think that's where the rubber hits the road with a lot of these things. And they're outside of this scheme because people have said, if I threshold here, I get this network out, but by thresholding, I miss that pit in the middle. So, yeah, so which is like um, this idea of like your, Johan, your voice is breaking the, 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 the old filter the crazy filter it's the crazy filter voice nope oh. it's a bit better now we are muted so we can't hear you anyways I'll just start recording anyway. Um, 